accompany this good old man to Jamestown, said the emperor to me. Give him every assistance and every advice so long a voyage requires. I accordingly went and conducted the abbe to the ship, which was to convey him to Europe. When I returned to Longwood, Napoleon said to me, Is he on board? Yes, sire. Comfortably? The ship appears good. And the crew? Well composed. So much the better. I should like to know that the good ecclesiastic were already arrived at Rome and safe from the dangers of the passage. What kind of reception do you think he will meet with at Rome? Do you not suppose it will be a favorable one? I did not give an immediate answer, and Napoleon resumed, At any rate, they owe it to me to treat him well, for after all, without me, what would have become of the church? Eighteenth. The emperor had passed a rather favorable night, but his strength still goes on declining. His pulse was low and nervous. He ate nothing and talked incessantly. His conversation was droll and lively. He joked about my pills, and I laughed at the terror they occasioned him. And was fortunate enough to make him forget his suffering for a few moments. He coughed. I ran to the calming draft. None of that, if you please, said he. I've already taken too much of your cookery. I'll have no more of it. But, sire, the cough. Of course, the cough, the liver, the stomach. I shall expire if I do not submit to swallow the juleps. I insisted. He railed at me. I entered into some details. He ridiculed them. And I was at last obliged to yield. Having escaped from taking the medicine, he was pleased and in good spirits and was inexhaustible on the subject of the profession and its followers. I excited him. I laid myself open to his satire and kept up that slight degree of contradiction which prolongs and animates conversation. To my arguments, he opposed cases. I explained them and was often right in spite of myself. He then varied his point of attack and his mode of discussion, always concluding by his favorite maxim that nothing is so prejudicial as medicines taken internally. This conclusion I could not possibly admit. It would have been peremptory, and I should have been henceforth unable to prevail upon him to use any medicine whatever. I therefore warmly opposed it, demonstrating to him how erroneous it was and to what injurious consequences it might lead. Nature, said I, undoubtedly nature is powerful and inexhaustible, but still she must be assisted and in most cases divined and interpreted. The emperor had exhausted all his means of defense, but unwilling to own the weakness of his theory, he seized upon the last word I had pronounced. Interpreted! You are a physician! I leave that to you. No, sire, I could not presume. What do you mean? Nothing could possibly be better done. Then what? To what do you allude? I laughed. Oh, I understand you. It is to the proclamation, is it not? Undoubtedly, the interpretation was good, but the councils were again raising an outcry against the priests. These unfortunate beings, rejected abroad, persecuted at home, and reduced to the last stage of misery, were on the point of perishing. I extended a friendly hand to them, and I welcomed them. The tribune dared not prescribe men that were protected by me. The persecution ceased, and I preserved to the church its ministers." and notified also the conclave, the inspirations of the Holy Ghost. No, a ballot was going on for three candidates to the Apostles C, Capra, Jardil, and Albani. The first was at the head of the discontented and was backed by Spain. I had nothing to say. The second was a kind of saint, the choice of the lower clergy and of devotees. His elevation was without political consequence, but Albany was dependent of Austria, possessing judgment, knowledge of the world, and a handsome person. He might be dangerous, and I therefore would not hear of him. I did not oppose his being made a bishop, but I could not acknowledge as a prince the murder of Basseville. It was far from my wish to interfere in matters of divine worship. The revolution had disturbed so many interests, and it was but fitting that religious opinions at least should be respected. I caused overtures to be made to the Pope. I proposed to him to join the French government, and to use his influence to consolidate the internal tranquility of the two states and contribute to the advantage of both. The moment has arrived, said I to him, for executing an operation in which wisdom, policy, and 
true religion are equally interested and in the performance of which they must equally concur. The French government has just given permission to open anew the churches of the Catholic, Apostolic, and Roman faith in grants to that religion, tolerance, and protection. The priests will either take advantage of this first act of the French government in the true spirit of the gospel by contributing to public tranquility and preaching the true maxims of charity, which are the foundation of the religion of the gospel, in which case I have no doubt that they will obtain a more special protection and that this will be a happy commencement towards the attainment of the end so much desired, or they will pursue a totally opposite line of conduct, in which case they will again be persecuted and driven away. The Pope as the chief of the faithful and the common center of faith may have a great influence over the conduct of the priests and he will perhaps think it worthy of his wisdom and of the most sacred of all religions to promulgate a bull or order prescribing to the priests to obey the government and do well in their power to consolidate the established constitution if that bull be expressed in terms concise and favorable to the great end which it may produce it will be a great step towards the reestablishment of order and extremely advantageous to the prosperity of religion after this first operation it would be useful to know what measures might be taken to reconcile the constitutional priests with those that are not constitutional lastly what measures the court of rome might propose to remove all obstacles and bring back the majority of the french people to principles of religion i request the ministers of his holiness to communicate these ideas to the pope and to transmit his answer to me as soon as possible the desire of being useful to religion is one of the principal motives that induce me to act the pure and simple doctrine of the gospel the wisdom policy and experience of the pope may if they are exclusively listened to produce fortunate results for the christian religion and the personal glory of his holiness 19th the patient had passed a pretty good night but his strength and spirits were much depressed and his pulse was frequent weak and nervous at 1 a.m the emperor who had only taken a few spoonfuls of soup had an attack of fever accompanied by general sensation of cold which lasted about three quarters of an hour and was principally felt at the lower extremities Pain in the head, general atony, oppression. Pain in the right hypochondriac region and the whole abdomen, dry cough, tongue damp and furred, throat and mouth lined with mucosities. Napoleon got out of bed, but his weakness increased and he experienced a sensation of extreme inappetency, plenitude, and oppression in the epigastric region. Costiveness in the abdomen, general anxiety, this state of agitation accompanied by a somber and peevish melancholy lasted until five o'clock in the afternoon. He then tried to take a spoonful of soup, but it was immediately rejected. Towards evening, he tasted a little charlotte and had a few minutes sleep at half past 11 p.m. He took a few spoonfuls of broth and an egg. The fever continued. 20th at 2 o'clock a.m., the emperor experienced a violent oppression in the stomach and a kind of painful suffocation in the chest. Madame Petrin came in, and he made an effort to appear less dejected. He inquired after her health, and having conversed for a few minutes with a degree of cheerfulness, he said, We must prepare for the fatal sentence. You... Ortons and myself are doomed to meet our fate upon this miserable rock. I shall go first, you will come next, and Ortons will follow. We shall all three meet again in the Elysian fields. He then began to recite these lines. Mais à revoir Paris, je ne dois plus prétendre, vous voyez, qu'au tombeau que je suis prête à descendre, je vais au roi. Des rois demandent aujourd'hui le prix de tous les maux que j'ai souffert pour lui. the 21st. I saw the emperor at 4 a.m. He had passed a very agitated night at 7. A dose of 7 drachms of castor oil was given to him in a cup full of herb broth, but it did not go down farther than the stomach, and the taste of it remained all day in his mouth without producing any effect. The spasmodic irritation of the stomach and the other abdominal 
Miss Sarah subsided, however, a little. The emperor had not slept all day. He had been some time reading and asked to be read to. Suddenly he was seized with a kind of delirium, which lasted about three hours, and during which he repeated little Italian songs, talked, laughed, and joked, as he usually did. When in good spirits and suffering less pain, the fever continued, but with less violence, the patient complained of being extremely tired. I felt how very useful an emetic would be, and I treated Napoleon to be wanting in his duty to himself and make a slight effort to take one, but the bare name of it wrought his repugnance to the highest pitch, and he replied to me, exaggerating in certainty of medicine, Can you even tell me in what my disease consists? Can you even point out the seat of it? It was in vain that I represented to him that the art of healing does not proceed like the exact sciences, that the seat and the cause of the affectations that are felt can only be established by inference. He would not admit any distinction of the kind. If such be the case, said he, keep physic. I will not have two diseases, that which I am afflicted, and that which you will inflict upon me. If I insisted, he accused us of working in the dark, of administering medicines at random, and of killing three-fourths of those who trust in us. Sometimes he assumed a tone which I shall never forget. I have entire confidence in you, said he. The manner in which you have practiced at Longwood has convinced me of your skill, but I have never taken any medicines. I consider them as uncertain and dangerous and prefer trusting to nature. Besides, life will live and does not require the assistance of art. I know my constitution and am persuaded that the slightest medicine would disorder my stomach. What say you, you rogue of a doctor? Do you not think so? Very well, sire. But a beverage slightly tinctured with emetic. What? An emetic beverage? Is that not a medicine? It list, however, he consented to take it. But how much I had insisted, entreated, disputed. It's 22nd. Night tolerable, sleep broken. Slight perspiration, vague pain sometimes in the liver. 23rd. The emperor slept a little at two. Paroxysm of fever accompanied by shivering at 10. Administered for the second time a quarter of a grain of tartar emetic, which was followed by abundant vomiting. The 24th. The emperor passed the remainder of the night tolerably well. At 10, the fever had lost a little of its intensity, but the oppression of the epigastric region and the sensation of suffocation were felt with increased violence. 25th, night tolerably quiet with abundant perspirations, the fever greatly diminished, and the emperor already spoke of his approaching recovery, but the abdomen was still swelled, and I endeavored to reestablish order in the mucous secretions of the digestive canal. 26, bad night, at 5 a.m., he had slight perspiration near the forehead and the upper extremities at seven, exacerbation of fever. The disease assumed every day a more serious character. I was afraid to trust to my own skill, and the emperor would not have any English physician. I found myself in a state of indescribable perplexity, which was further increased by an indiscreet offer from the governor. A physician had arrived whose skill was incomparable and who could cure every disorder. He thought the services of such a man might be useful to General Bonaparte, and he therefore placed him at the general's disposal in order to be a second edition of Baxter. And to make false bulletins, does the governor still want to deceive Europe, or is he already thinking of the autopsy? I will not have any man who is in communication with him. I made no observations upon the suspicions expressed by the emperor and seized a moment when he was more tranquil, to hazard a few words about the necessity of a consultation. A consultation? What would be the use of it? You all work in the dark. Another physician would not see more than you do what is passing in my body. And if he pretended that he could see more, I should call him a quack. I should lose the little confidence I have still left in the sons of Hippocrates. Besides, who should I consult? Englishmen? Who would be inspired by Hudson? No. Well, I'm none of them. I have already told you so. I prefer letting the crime be accomplished. The stain resulting from it will be equal to all my sufferings. The emperor was warm, and I therefore did not insist for the moment, but waited until he was more calm when I again pressed the subject. You persist, said he, 
with a tone of kindness. Well, I give my consent. Consult with the physician of the island that you consider the most skillful. I applied to Dr. Arnott, surgeon of the 20th Regiment, and described to him the symptoms of the complaint and the principal circumstances of the emperor's life. His opinion was, first, to apply a large blister over the whole of the abdominal region. Second, to administer a purgative. Third, to make frequent aspersions of vinegar on the forehead. When I rejoined the patient, the fever had decreased. He shook his head, appeared very little satisfied, and added, that is English practice. <laughs>